welcome to Unsightly Opinions. If you're new, my name's Tamara. Today, I am very excited. I will be doing my very first Q&A, answering questions that you have posted over the last few weeks in my comment section for this video. You came up with some really fantastic ideas. We are gonna be talking about traveling, music, dating, my five-year plan, disability, blindness, and everything in between. So stay tuned for all of that. I need to stop for a moment and say thank you once again. This video is happening because we reached 500 subscribers. This is what you wanted to see. Thank you again for all of your support. I would not be nearly as motivated to make all this content. I wouldn't be nearly as inspired if you weren't so engaged. I hope we can reach the next milestone soon. Now, let's dive into the questions. I will be paraphrasing very slightly, but the actual comment with the question will be listed on screen. Let's start with our first question from Poodle Eyes. They want to know about where I've traveled and what my experience is traveling as a blind person. This could definitely be a video all on its own, and I probably will make one as soon as I'm back traveling after the pandemic's finished, after it's safe to travel again. I do travel frequently for work, for speaking, for a variety of different business endeavors, and the occasional family vacation or personal vacation, so I do everything from trains, planes, and automobiles, and everything in between. I have been most places in Canada, which is where I live. I have been many, many places, particularly on the coasts of the US, down in to Texas. I've gone into many places in the Caribbean and Central America, Mexico. I've gone all over Europe, including the UK. I've even gone to the northernmost part of Africa and visited Egypt and some really cool countries there. I would say my experience is not a visual one when I travel. I can't go to museums and look at artwork and really appreciate any of that. Just not being able to see it visually and not having people translate it for me in a way that's engaging makes it complex. So when I travel, I like to be an experiential tourist. I like to truly immerse myself in culture, immerse myself in how people live their lives, try and learn the language, speak to people in their language, and live like they do as much as is possible. I want to learn about people's experience, and I want to hear stories. And I really like hearing stories from people that don't have the same experience as me. For me, that's the engaging part of travel. I want to tour places even if I can't see them. Like, I've been to the Colosseum, I've been able to touch the rocks, I've been able to understand what things are just by hearing people talk and learning about the history. So that's what travel is like for me. In terms of the complexities of actually getting there and doing stuff and traveling independently, that's definitely something I'll touch on in another video. It's a complex process. I have to be very willing to accept help. I have to be patient with myself. I have to be calm when I get lost because that happens almost every time. But that's part of the fun, is learning how to navigate, learning how to be independent, in a completely new environment. Louise Piano Keys asked two different questions. The first one was about music and the second one was about dating. So let's talk about dating first. My history with dating is complex as I think most people's are. Dating with a disability, dating when you're blind, definitely add some complexities to the whole dating experience. When I started dating, I was very much somebody who wanted to do it the traditional route. I wanted to meet somebody in person. I didn't want to do online dating. And that worked with varying degrees of success. I've had a lot of first and last dates. I will be telling you the story of my worst date ever because I can laugh at it now, but it really hurt me in the moment. There's a lot of things that you have to think about, particularly as a disabled woman. Safety is a big issue. I have been in some situations where you're meeting somebody for the first time and it hasn't felt entirely safe and it's made me nervous. So I always have somebody know where I am. I always let somebody track me on find my iPhone. I always let somebody know where I'm going to be at what time and have them check in periodically just to make sure that I am safe. So I have to take all of those safety factors into consideration, but more importantly, trying to find somebody that's willing to accept you for your disability because I know that dating someone with a disability may seem daunting to a lot of people, may seem like it's going to be a lot of work, may seem like it's going to be a one-sided relationship. And I feel that even though that's not the case, I am just as giving in my relationship as I am receiving love where 
there are some things that I cannot do in a relationship like drive, so maybe my partner Robbie picks up the slack on that more for me. I make it back in other ways, like making nice dishes for dinner. Everyone has different expectations in a relationship, so I feel communication early on is very important. Making sure that I am honest and open about my experience, my expectations, and what it's like if they want to be in a relationship with me. There has to be chemistry and there has to be a want on both sides to continue the relationship. There's so much to dive into there in terms of when to disclose your disability and how I've done that. And it's been different every time. And it depends on when I feel safe to do that. I'm very happy in my relationship right now. I feel it's a very equal relationship. We give and take each the same amount. And if one person needs more, then the other person's willing to do that. And then when the balance shifts, the reverse happens. So I think it's finding somebody who's willing to accept you as you are and willing to explore life with you. At least that's what relationships are for me. Getting on to Louise Piano Keys' second question, what is my musical background? I will be doing an entire video talking about my experience with music and what it does for me. It is probably one of my greatest joys in life. It has been my emotional and physical outlet for as long as I can remember and is probably one of the most important things that I do on a daily basis. The Coles Notes version is I started music when I was four or five. I started with violin. My parents are both professional musicians, albeit in very different genres. My mom was a concert pianist and my dad is still a professional recording musician, producer, and plays regularly with his bands. They wanted me to have the same experience with music that they had. They both both had this love for music, this need to have music in their life, but they didn't make it their career. So they wanted me to have that same experience, to have music as a hobby, to have it as something that could be a stress reliever, to have it as something that could be an outlet for me as I moved through life. They saw music to be as fundamental to life as swimming or learning how to run or tie your shoes. And I'm really thankful for that because music has brought me so much. I'm gonna try and tell you all of the instruments I play right Right now and I'll probably forget a couple. I play violin and have played professionally since about the age of nine. I play piano, I play flute and saxophone, I play clarinet, I play both of the high and low Irish whistles. I'm really terrible but I do some percussion and I'm just learning guitar now and I also sing. So it's safe to say that I eat, sleep and breathe music and I feel it's important for me, even though I play quite a few instruments at a professional level, to always come back to trying to learn something else, to feel that frustration of not being able to immediately master something because when I'm working with kids, when I'm working with my students, I feel it's important that I don't forget how challenging it is at the beginning. So that's something that I do, not only to enrich what I can do as a musician and understand arranging and how to write in different instruments and what works and what doesn't, but to let my students know that I am experiencing the same thing they are, even if it's on a different instrument. And I haven't forgotten what it's like and I don't just say, oh, well, it's easy, just do it like this. I want to create a world where every child has the right to access music education where no matter what your ability or disability is you can find tools to help you experience the joys and love that I got to experience as a child and still do to this day. So that's the Coles Notes version, but there will be a more complete story if you want to see that. Let me know. That'll be coming out sometime next month. Jeremy Peters wants to know, what constitutes a disability and is there some form of threshold that you have to meet to call yourself disabled? Ooh, that's a loaded question. I think that as somebody with disabilities, it can feel challenging to know when you can call yourself disabled and when you can't. There is no strict rule for, oh, you have to have X, Y, or Z diagnosis to be considered disabled. If something is impacting you significantly in your life, in how you do things, if you have to significantly adapt what you do or how you do it, or if you have a difference that prevents you from doing something physically, cognitively, intellectually, or from a mental health perspective, and it impacts significantly on your daily life, you can call yourself disabled. I think that there's an equally valid discussion talking about 
situational disability, which is how I feel about my blindness. When I am in a space that works for me, when I am in an accessible space, I don't feel disabled. I don't consider myself disabled. I don't consider myself to have a disability. When I can't do everything the way other people do them, when there aren't accommodations, I do feel disabled. So I think that's equally valid. I also think there's a third kind of disability, which is temporary disability. If you break your arm or you break your leg, that's temporary disability. You will get better from that, but you do have a disability. You at some point cannot do some things with your body or with your mind. It's difficult to try and gatekeep what is disabled enough, what is not disabled enough, and I don't want to be a person to put that boundary in place. Because if you feel that that label fits you, if you feel that that label is something that you need or you would like to feel part of a community that has a similar experience to yourself, use that label. I have no problems. I don't feel gatekeeping is healthy or right. Fairheart wants to know what my preference is for cane or guide dog and couldn't remember if I use a guide dog or not. Yes, I am a guide dog user. I have a lovely little brindle black lab named Patience. She is my favorite dog. I love her to pieces and she is my third guide dog. I personally prefer to use a guide dog, but I know a guide dog isn't right for everyone. I choose to use a guide dog because of how I live my life, because of how many new environments I'm in, because of how much I travel, because of how often I'm in unfamiliar territory. If I was more sedentary, if I wasn't going places every single day, if I was doing the same route over and over, maybe a guide dog wouldn't be right for me. But because I am so many different places, even though I am a good cane user, and there are situations when I still use my cane, I think 99.9% .9 of the time I will choose a guide dog over a cane. If I can use my guide dog, if I can take her places where it isn't going to endanger her, or it isn't going to bring her serious discomfort like loud concert venues, construction sites, or a science laboratory or a factory, then absolutely I'll be using my guide dog. But if it's not safe for her to go, I don't bring her and I absolutely use my cane. So it's a balancing act. There is never going to be one perfect mobility tool for every situation. It's just what your personal preference is and mine is a guide dog. The final question comes from JC5 Productions and they want to know where I see myself in five years, either in my life or or in my career? I think this is truly a fantastic question because it's not one that I think about very often. I do make plans, I do make goals, I do decide where I want to go with specific projects, but I don't think I make an overarching goal for my entire life or my entire career. Because I've always been a person that needs to be flexible because of my disabilities and the things that I do are very feast and famine and I've had to negotiate that into my my life and work on one project one week and another project another week, I would like to find more stability, maybe a single project or a couple of projects that keep me busy full time, whether that's something in disability work, finding something where I can change the world in some small way to break down barriers for people with disabilities so that they don't have to struggle the same way I did growing up. If I could work full time in music, if I could find ways to inspire a younger generation to find passion, to find themselves. I don't want to shut myself down. I don't want to close any doors at this time, but I would like to work on a single project. I think in five years, I would still like to be doing videos. I'd like to work with more companies to make spaces accessible. That would be something else I'd love to do. But in terms of my personal life, I think in five years, I would like to be financially stable enough to buy a home. Not to be paying a mortgage for 50 years, but to, to properly own a home in five years. I think that would truly tell me that I have found success in my life. Not that home ownership is everything, but that's that's a personal goal for me. And in five years, and this is totally a pipe dream, I would love to own a car that drives me wherever I need to go without the need of ride share or public transit. I think that would be fantastic. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like content like this, keep those questions coming. I will happily do another one. If you wanna support the channel, you can subscribe, hit that like button, share videos around, comment, and refer people over to this channel. If you wanna keep up to date with what's going on in between uploads, you can check out my other social media accounts linked in the description down below, or my Twitch streams, which are Sundays and Tuesdays, well, most Tuesdays anyways, 7.30 Mountain Standard Time, but that's all for today. Bye for now.